Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everybody. Do you guys want to stand up for 30 seconds or a minute or so? Just, just stand up for a sec. Just, just. <laughs> and, and while you're standing, while you're standing, I want to take a moment again to, to thank uh, Margaret, um, Murray, um, Dean Spangenberg, and, um, you know, I've been, you can sit down if you want. Um, you can stand if you want. It's a free country, although yesterday it didn't sound like it. Uh, <clears throat> I should start by telling you, so I go back a long ways back when Paul Feldman was, was chipping ones and zeros on stone tablets to develop his first economic models. Um, and uh, personally, we have a lot of very well-educated people on this panel. I'm a, I'm a reasonably um, stable, non-genius journeyman. Um, um, I've been working in healthcare for a long time. And I am speaking on behalf of myself, uh, my company, every board silly enough to have me on it, and um, people who agree with me and people who don't. So I want to talk a little bit to this theme of, of disruption and innovation in the healthcare market, and I, and I want to try to make it practical and as, as understandable as possible. We've had a great setup with Michael talking about data and justice, Paul bringing a person and humanization into this, and Lisa talking about the extension, actually, of human and human capability um, through, through, through innovation. Um, I have the saying that disruption in healthcare has to be very respectful. It has to be based on an understanding of the way things work. I also want to tell you that disruption is sometimes a blinding flash of the obvious, of things that exist. How many of you have an iPhone or an Android phone? Okay. Did Apple invent digital voice or cellular? Did they invent texting? Did Samsung invent email? Did they invent video? Did either company invent programming? Hmm. So, so the most disruptive innovation of our time is actually a convergence and an integration of other things that have existed for some time, right? And so I'm actually a system scientist by training, I think, I think systematically. Let me just, just take a moment um, to, to, touch, to touch on well talk, a very brief moment. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today is about a concept of consumers in healthcare. And what I want you to think about is whether you're a, whether you're a provider organization or a health plan or a community entity uh, or a research institute, you have reasons that you actually need to have a direct communication with a human being, with a person. And if I ask you in healthcare, what is the platform that allows you to set up across all modalities of communication and have that communication? You probably would scratch your head and say, well, I got to pull a whole bunch of stuff together. And when we think about the healthcare industry, we're thinking about not just health plans or health systems, all of which are our customers. We're thinking about what is the common thread of reaching a consumer. And you all, you all have your reasons for reaching a consumer. It might be to grow your businesses. It might be to impact healthcare uh, trend or quality, or just to unify what's uh, often a, a fragmented consumer experience. That's, that's why we're in business. Um, and we're a fast-growing company. That's really not the point here. Um, I actually wanted to, to make a point on innovation. Um, it's kind of a scary point. 
Um, but I want to give you a couple statistics. Um, I'll, bet, I'll bet those of you who are part of organizations have IT departments. Did you, um, what percentage of healthcare IT or technology companies do you think get to $10 million of sustainable revenue? About 20, no, it's about 10%. What percentage get to 20 million? It's about 5%. How many of you have IT departments that spend more than that? Don't, don't laugh it's, or cry, whatever. <laughs> 2% of, of companies get to 50 million sustainable revenue and less than 1% get to 100 million. <laughs> In a sustainable healthcare economy of $3.1 trillion. All right, so this is actually a reason to either not be too frightened about what happens when big technology companies try to enter the healthcare space or to be terrified. We'll decide which one together, right? But we do have a perfect storm brewing, right? Because, because this, this idea of consumer, um, which is not the same as a patient, by the way. Patients receive care. Consumers make choices. Engaged patients are adherent or compliant. That's the language of medicine. Engaged consumers are accountable for their health status and, and the cost of achieving that status. But all throughout healthcare, consumer initiatives are top of mind for executives. Reimbursement, whether it's in provider or payer, is more and more dependent on interaction with consumers. And then, just like these things, we have all these point solutions and things that can directly interact with consumers cropping up prolifically that create really a lot of noise. So what do we do about that? So this is actually, a, this is an illustration out of a book I published, um, The Healthcare Cure, some years ago. Um, and it's the parable, of course, of the blind, the blind men and the elephant as it relates to the healthcare system. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that, um, you know, I very much disagree with uh, Mr. Ng and at Baidu that the great minds in artificial intelligence can somehow jump into healthcare. Artificial intelligence is limited by human intelligence. And by the way, in fairness, the IBM MD Anderson story, which is characterized as a failure, is working in other multiple places um, where, where artificial intelligence in a clinical sense is being applied, uh, right, with great, great results. Sometimes it's the people applying it. Ooh, not the technology. Ooh, that was tough. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah. But, but the point is, I think everyone in this room, by, by attending this conference, knows it, it takes quite a bit of time to learn and understand the healthcare system. Frankly, you can be a practicing physician for years and not know how the healthcare system works. You can be a hospital administrator and not know how the healthcare system works. You can be running a line of business inside an insurance company and not know how the healthcare system works. Is that surprising to people? Because you gotta put it all together, right? And the other thing I just wanna touch on when it comes to, to technology is there's all these, we talk about imbalance and all the haves and have nots. Most of the have nots are people that are intimidated by technology <laughs> as opposed to somebody actually goes to the effort. It's, it's nice to create wow and gee whiz factor about all these technology terms so that the average person thinks they can't access or use or be part of it. But that's just, that's not healthy. It's really important in healthcare to understand the difference between gadgets. And I say gadgets are things that sense and produce data and possibly display it. And there's a lot of them. And they're prolific. And some of them are FDA approved devices and some of them are consumer devices. And they just pump out data. And then there's machine learning information technology that takes all that data and actually does something useful with it. Um, that's what we're trying to do um, and having some success in. 
Um, to be innovative, I guess the best, the best lesson I ever learned in health uh, in information technology was when I was a jazz guitarist. On the, on the wall of the jazz room, it said, to be truly innovative, you must first be steeped in tradition. What that means is you can't riff or improvise in any meaningfully innovative way unless you can actually play the classics. People don't like to hear that. And we have a society today that's pretty lazy about that. Because you can Google something, which is a verb. <laughs> and really almost convince yourself you're an expert on a topic. Crazy. But it's true. So let's just deal with it. So, so Paul touched on this a little bit. But what we're, trying, what we're doing at Well Talk is is working to solve the biggest unsolved problem in healthcare, which is this notion that 70% of what drives health is non-clinical and, and non-genetic. Non We're not trying to do it by saying the clinical care is unimportant or that the genomic and other omic science that's coming up is not important. Of course it's important. It's just not the most important thing. That can fix healthcare today. Um, and that's a little hard to, to fathom, too. But think about it this way. We are, as human beings, people spend far less than 1% of their time in a clinical setting. You know, even a frail elderly will spend 99.9-ish .9 percent of their time living uh, their daily lives. And we know that 70% of the things that drive health um, are not clinical or genomic, right? So um, I think I have a slide missing here, but that's OK. Um, well, what we've done pretty well, and this is what Trizetto created, was, was only about a decade and a half, two decades ago, we had all these pieces of what I call the sick care system. Um, fragmented about. Um, and what Trizetto did was basically made it so you could turn hospitals, all types of physicians from primary care to specialists, all kinds of diagnostic capabilities, pharmacy and supplies into networks to provide software so that whether it was Aetna or Cigna or Blue Cross Blue Shield or a hospital-based health plan could turn those networks into product and put that product around a person. Systems, system science. You can call it technology, but it's about systems. Well, if you look at what's going on today with the consumer and things that consumers can do by themselves and on their own, um, those things are proliferating. And you, some of you who were here yesterday heard me attack the attack on wellness. <laughs> I still hate the term wellness, but the point is, let's not pretend like health literacy, condition management programs, proper fitness or nutrition pro cannot help people. Of course they can. It's common sense. The problem is, when you throw one-size-fits-all programming, and try to work it out of the medical system, and doctors really like babysitting people the other 99% of their lives, don't you all? It, it's, it, it doesn't work, right? So systematically, you have to find a way to create a system, which happens to use software, that can surround the consumer with a personalized set of resources that can be informed by physicians, and can be informed by health plans, but truly are relevant to the consumer, to the human being. And again, respectfully connecting the sick care system to what I call optimized health. The opposite of sick care uh, or illness is not wellness, but it's taking people where they are on their morbidity curve and trying to get them to their optimal health, no matter who they are. I have Crohn's disease. I'm going to have a certain peak health I can achieve. And it's going to be different than someone who doesn't.
So here's the big thing I want to set up for you in this conference is everyone's talking about personalization. Everyone uses the same words. It's a little bit like capital I internet in 1999. About 99% of the companies that use the word failed because they couldn't find a commercial path or a way to get there. What I, what I want to propose to you is there's really a two-axis personalization that, that is and must occur in healthcare. There is the personalization of medicine. I'm not a clinician, um, but I know that as we go through the omic data, the EMR, the EHR data, and so there, there, there are actions that are best performed by physicians and clinicians and other types of medical professionals, and that's great. And they're gonna get better and better, and therapies are gonna get better and better. That's terrific, okay? But what we also know is that there's things that consumers should be doing. They're the best people to take their own actions. And so I want you to imagine, anyone a Dr. Seuss fan in here? You know, so, so Dr. Seuss you know, would draw like a, all these pictures of like these funny horns and stuff. And I want you to imagine a very simple device. It's got a tube in one end and two, two tubes coming out the bottom. And which, you know, take some colorful thing, and let's call it a data insight. And you drop that data insight into the top of the tube and it splits into two parts. One insight is the thing that scarce and relatively expensive medical resources can do to help a person fix what ails them. The other are actions a consumer can take for themselves to achieve and sustain their optimal health. They're complementary, they can be brought back together, but which one do you think has more power to move the healthcare system today? And so what we do is we take classic, with respect to the current system, we take classic data, claims, clinical data, so forth, but we add a layer of consumer data. If I was to tell you, I could tell you more about who's likely to have disease by knowing their transportation pattern, the hours they work, and their zip code than you can from an EMR, EHR, would you scoff at me? It shouldn't scare you, it should excite you, um, because it's true. And the thing is though, is just because we can use consumer data to create better lists of who can be impacted, who's at risk, who might be receptive, you still gotta cross that chasm to actually activate the consumer. And what, what we essentially do is we, we use consumer data to augment the classical data in healthcare, respectfully, but then we recognize that all the things I just told you, whether it's text or email or apps or web or have to be brought through to the consumer in a way that they can use and consume things. And that has to be done under the brand of your hospital or of your health plan or of sort of, um, we're, not, we're not about branding, we're just about helping. And so we're doing five things that are kind of um, innovative uh, that I would tell you about because health population managers are trying to activate consumers intelligently. Consumers want to be healthy and get rewarded. The first thing we do is we take this classic data, we overlay it with a proprietary consumer database, 275 million Americans, 800 variables apiece. We have a machine learning model that's cranked over 20 million iterations so far to understand the relationship between all those data pieces. We do something really, really, really strange as we actually ask the consumer on our platform what they're interested in doing. I know, stop. Um, and then we actually pick up data on consumer activity. This completes, this, this, this moves us from knowing 30% about a consumer to understanding them, which is something all your organizations need to do. Next. We love all these proliferating point solutions. Some of them are great, some of them are not so great. The point is they're hard to access, they're hard to curate. 
Our software allows uh, organizations to turn these into a unified user experience, to put them into groupings of things that you would understand in healthcare, like gaps and condition management and prevention, um, and allows those to be put in front of the consumer so they can complete activities and you can get your objectives accomplished. Third, we integrate all the different types of modalities that a consumer um, might need to interact with. Some people are gonna want to do things with coaching or high touch assistance. Some people are gonna be more comfortable doing things fully digitally, but you gotta be able to distribute those to the right people under the right mechanisms. Fourth, just like we pay physicians and hospitals for performance, why is it the consumers don't get paid for performance? So we actually, we allow the attachment of incentives and rewards to any activity a consumer might undergo so they can share in the healthcare $3.1 trillion system. And they can be participation-based or outcomes-based. We don't have to argue. And then we do apply artificial intelligence, um, which can be natural language, uh, it can be coaching uh, assisted, or it can be uh, self-guidance. Um, and today's not a commercial about well talk, but I'm just trying to sort of show you the pieces. But the way it kind of works is if Maria is a consumer, she has her own interests. If you're a health plan or a health system, you have your claims and EHR data, which is telling you what you want Maria to do. Um, and then there's evidence-based guidelines for a person like Maria of what she should do. Those things all comprise, if you will, a set that can, through the concept of mass customization, produce personalized N of one health itinerary for Maria using cloud-based SaaS software, right? Um, and of course, this is all predicated on privacy and security um, in our system, we're not just spinning off of EMRs, EHRs, or benefit systems, all which are full of identifiable data, but the basis of our system is anonymity. Okay, um, I'll just finish by saying humbly that, that there are incredible innovations going on in health systems in the Uniteds and Aetnas and Sigmas Cygnus and, and blues of the world and so forth. A lot of, a lot of things being spent. It's, it's very humbling when you're trying to create a company that you're being utilized uh, in those types of, of companies uh, because they have a lot of talent and frankly they spend a lot to develop stuff that tries to crush you and put you out of business. And by the way, so do the not-for-profit hospital systems. They spend a lot of money trying to develop technology that crush innovation and put vendors out of business. And um, we think it's really important. Um, what I would leave you with is just, just a thought before we get into the Q&A, which is, which is um, oops, they gave me the wrong slide, but, but we're focused on consumers. Uh, consumers is a larger population than patients. It's a larger population than members. It's all of us, most of the time, right, as opposed to patients who are some of us, some of the time. It needs to work together, and uh, that's kind of how we think about innovation, which is respecting what is and adding what needs to be. Thank you.